I get contacted all the time by people wanting to get a bird of prey or get into falconry. It's really good that these people are seeking out advice without just going out and getting a bird of prey, but there are some difficult truths that I think needs to be said before doing so. So in this video, I'm going to be going over some things that you need to be told before getting a bird of prey. And this is not just my opinion, I went and asked a bunch of my falconry friends what they think are some difficult truths about getting into falconry and they came back with a massive list of really important things. So that's what we're going to discuss today. First, I have to say, it's not for everybody. Some people are just not cut out for it, and that's okay. People are good at many things, but hunting, owning, and training a bird of prey is just not for everybody. And if you just go and rush out and get yourself a bird of prey without knowing the nitty gritty day-to-day -day work of owning a bird, then you might discover that you don't quite like it and it's not really for you. And then the hawk it will never unlock her full potential or she's just gonna have to be passed to another falconer. And this is not really good for the birds. We don't want to be passing them around from people to people. Make sure you have enough experience before getting a hawk so that you understand all of the less glamorous side of falconries before you decide to get into it. Next are my two biggest points. And this was repeated by every falconer that I asked and that's time and money. Let's talk about time first. Owning a bird of prey is not like owning a pet. They have such specialist needs. You can't think it will be no different to just taking your dog out for a walk when you get home from work. It's so true that you get out of your bird exactly what you put in. If you spend seven days a week training your hawk, then you're gonna have an adequately trained and fit bird. If it's something you just pick up on a weekend and try and do a bit of work with, then she's not going to be anywhere near as good as she could be. There are slight exceptions to this. Once you've got a well-trained household, for example, they've got a relaxing enough nature that they can spend a few days off and you can still then go and pick them up and fly them. But still, she's never going to be as good as if you're flying her every single day. Falconry really can begin to feel like a 24-7 job and it ends up being a lifestyle. If you're not willing to commit to your hawk, then you shouldn't have one. And that also spreads to little things like holidays and getaways. I have nine birds of prey. I had to Google what a holiday is just to make this video, but we'll come back to that later on. Let's move on to the money aspect. I would have a damn sight more money than I do if I didn't own nine birds of prey. While food for a hawk can be sourced really cheaply or even free if you're going to hunt by yourself, and the hawks themselves don't tend to cost that much. All the completely necessary equipment that you will need for her really does start to add up in price. The amount of equipment that you need for one hawk really can sneak up on you. For just one hawk, some of the things that you will need include an aviary, a receiver, a transmitter, jesses, anklets, swivel, leash, herches, travel box, suitable vehicle, a fridge and a freezer for storing their food, a glove, a bag, a hood, telemetry mounting system, a set of scales for weighing her, the list goes on. Another aspect with regards to money is veterinary care. Taking any kind of bird of prey to a vet can get quite pricey quite quickly. An example of this is with Kit, my barn owl. One day, when she was a bit younger, she had a bit of an off day. She was dropping her wings a little bit, looking very tired, and she'd started to open her beak to breathe. We rushed her straight to the vets where we had all these tests done, two different types of blood tests. She had fluids, she had an x-ray, and they even gave us precautionary medications. And all of this amounted to just over 500 pounds. It turns out there was absolutely nothing wrong with her. She was just having a bad day. And if a bad day can rack up a bill of up to 500 pounds, imagine the kind of price you're gonna pay if there actually is something wrong with your heart. And that leads us quite nicely onto another thing that you need to be told, and that's that things will go wrong. It doesn't matter if you're the world's best falconer or a completely average one. At some point, something's going to go wrong. Animals can be really unpredictable at times, especially in falconry, where the environment that they are flown, trained and hunted in can also be incredibly unpredictable. Of course, we take as many steps to reduce risks as possible, like having the correct equipment, knowing your land that you're flying on, being registered with a proper avian vet, but it's impossible to remove all of the risk of an accident ever happening. At some point, it's just going to go wrong. 
And these accidents can be anything from your hawk flying off, to your hawk getting injured in the field, and even your hawk getting an illness while still at home. The important constant with any situation needs to be the way that you handle it and the way that you react. If you can't deal with stressful situations, and if you can't compose yourself and work rationally and quickly, then you shouldn't have a bird of prey. When an accident happens with a bird of prey, the way that you act will greatly affect the outcome. So there is a natural ability involved in falconry that just not everybody has. The natural ability to remain calm and relaxed in stressful situations. But there is also just a natural ability whilst working day to day with the hawks when nothing has gone wrong. There is a perfect level of confidence that falconers have to show their birds and it's very difficult to show or be taught how to do this. If you're not very confident with your hawk, she will pick up on this instantly and then she will take advantage and she will try to show dominance over you. And this could be things like throwing her feet towards you to grab you. If that surprises you, then you will likely start to be even more nervous and then she'll try to do it even more and you will end up in just this vicious cycle until it becomes a completely unworkable relationship. If you are overconfident with her, then you will likely scare her and that will make it really difficult to get your hawk trained. The ability to perfectly match your confidence level to best respect each hawk's needs is a really important quality every falconer should have. Let's talk about who else you are dragging into some level of falconry when you get into it yourself. There is a reason most falconers are either divorced, single or in a relationship with somebody who can handle falconry to some extent. As we have already discussed, falconry is a lifestyle. That means when you get into it, you are forcing some amount of it onto everybody around you. If you have a family, you're either going to have to say goodbye to a large portion of time that you would be spending with them, or you're going to have to get them involved too. Training a bird of prey is an achievement and you're going to want to talk about it. So that means that your mates are going to have to get used to an unnecessary amount of bird talk whilst hanging out. If you have neighbours, it's very likely there will be an adjustment for them as well. Seeing, hearing and even smelling a bird of prey will likely be very new to them. It can also cause complications if your neighbours have other kinds of pets. You don't want your hawk to be stressed and jumping around all over the place whilst tethered on the lawn because it can't get to the family bunny eating the grass a few doors down. I said we'd come back to holidays at some point, so let's discuss it. It's really difficult to take a holiday when you own a bird of prey, and this is something your family or friends are going to have to learn to accept. A bird of prey is not like a dog where you can just drop her off at the kennels or grandma's house. You even need to have a local friend with enough knowledge and skills to help you look after them whilst you're away, or you need to find a local falconer who is willing to help. Another thing that needs to be said is that there is not just some easy to apply formula on how to train your hawk. Of course there are techniques and methods that all follow a similar path that result in a well-trained hog, but there are many variations, things that work well for one falconer that might not work well for another. And every bird is an individual with unique needs. You have to be able to adapt your knowledge to best suit each bird. When doing research and learning, you might even find certain falconers' opinions contradict each other. And it's just your job to have to work out which is going to be best for you and your hawk. Some of these varying methods might only have a tiny change, but that leads us on to my next point, and that's that very small changes can have an amplified effect on a new hawk. Birds of prey are a funny animal. They can be triggered into being angry or scared by just the slightest of changes, changes that you might not even notice yourself. In order to best train your hawk, you need to have a good understanding of their behaviour and of the training methods. If you don't know how to properly read and communicate with your hawk, you'll have a really difficult time training her. You need to put in the research and learning before getting yourself a hawk. If you're not willing to train yourself before you can train a hawk, then you shouldn't have one. It might sound a bit strange me having to say that weather can be a hard truth about falconry, but it's still worth mentioning. We've all been there, we wake up and open the blinds to see that it's absolutely chucking it down outside and we decide we're going to have an inside day, watch some TV. It's never harmed the dog to have one day off walking. You can't do that if you own a bird of prey. Here in the UK, it rains a lot, 
and it can be pretty miserable weather a lot of the time. If I only ever flew my birds when it was glorious sunshine, they would hardly ever fly. Even if it's way too wet to fly, you still need to get out there to go and wait and feed your hawk and interact with her. If you want to be a hunting falconer, the open game season happens during the winter. If you're not willing to get up on a crisp winter morning and freeze your fingers off whilst filling up a bird bath so she can be perched out on the lawn, then you shouldn't own a hawk. Another hard truth is how potentially dangerous these animals can be. Unless you have gained the proper hands-on experience and understand how to properly handle a hawk, she will do you some damage. Birds of prey have talons. If your exposed hand is in the wrong position and she's in the wrong mood, then she will grab you and it will hurt. Their toes are different to ours. Our tendons are nice and smooth. It allows us to wriggle and move our toes freely. The tendons in a bird of prey's toes are almost like a tie wrap. They lock into place. And this is so that when they're in the wild, they don't let go of their prey. But it does also mean that if they grab you, it's going to be very painful and they are going to lock into position. The first thing you're going to want to do is try and pull those toes out of your flesh. As soon as you try and touch a toe, she will tighten even more and then lock them again. You have to just sit and wait for her to let go by herself. If you can't handle pain, you will not do well in this situation and you probably shouldn't own a hawk. This next one is kind of difficult for me to speak about without being demonetized by YouTube, so I'm going to have to use my words carefully. If you want to become a hunting falconer, you have to be comfortable dispatching the prey. I don't think that people realize that when a hawk catches her prey, she doesn't always finish the job before she tucks in to eat it. It's incredibly cruel to watch a live animal getting eaten by a hawk, and so it becomes a falconer's job to finish the job. What? This is difficult without saying the words that YouTube will demonetize me with. So, it's really cruel to watch your hawk eating something alive without finishing it yourself. Here in the UK, it's law that as soon as you catch something, it's then your responsibility to prevent any unnecessary suffering. That means that you have to be comfortable ending the life of the prey that your hawk has caught. It's all well saying that yes, you can be comfortable with that, but you just don't know unless you have been in that situation. My final hard truth about falconry comes with the death of a hawk. And this is not something anyone can ever prepare for. No matter how well you take care of her, the fact is, that humans live longer than hawks and it's very likely that at some point you will have to face this. It's an incredibly difficult thing to go through. After all the effort that you've put into training her and caring for her and all the successes that you've had whilst flying her, to lose her is really hard. And it can be said for any animal that you own but that doesn't make it any easier. It's just something that you need to accept is going to happen one day when you first get your hawk. I'm sure there are many more difficulties to discover when being a new hawk owner, but I'm hoping that these points that I've talked about will open the eyes of some people and make them think twice before pursuing falconry. I know some of my audience are experienced falconers, so if there are any points that I missed that you think should be mentioned, then please leave it as a comment so everybody else can see it. Make sure to like and subscribe, and thank you for watching.